Eddie Davis? Yes. This is Steve Perry. How you doing? Hey, Steve. I'm great. How about you? I'm doing good. How's everything in Atlantic City? No complaints, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And welcome back. I'm looking over some of your materials and you're getting a, you know, a vibe for the new album. And the first lyrics are, I know it's been a long time coming. And boy, has it been, huh? For me too, Eddie. <laughs> for me too. Yeah. So what took so long? Well, um, you really want to know, Eddie? I'll, yeah. I mean, how much time you got, right? Well, how much time do we have? I know. Um, well, when when I was in the band, we worked really hard, and uh, it got to a point where I started to lose my passion, my heartfelt passion for music, and that was the very thing I discovered when I was like five, six years old as a kid, and I brought that with me into the band, and I always loved what we wrote together, but towards the end, I was getting burnt out, and um, I just needed to stop, and so... I did, and it was not a popular thing to do, but I knew uh, if I continued down that road, uh, it was probably going to be a bad idea, so I just stopped. Steve Perry here on the Light Rock Morning Show. His new album, it took about 25 years, is called Traces. It's coming out in October. We have a first song, and he's here to tell us about it. You say that you just weren't feeling it anymore. Was it a lack of confidence or just the passion was gone? I think it was straight burnout and a lack of passion. I mean, um, we worked so hard, and you can only take a sponge and wring it out so many times before it just runs out of juice, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think I was just dry. I do. I understand that, Steve. And honestly, when you look at the different incarnations of Journey that have gone on and go on to this day, as you know, I'll yeah. tell you, do you sometimes wonder, how do those guys not feel that? I, I, I can't speak for them. Uh, they seem to be continuing. and they're, they're a tireless machine, that's for sure. Yeah, but obviously you thought, I, I just couldn't do it. Well, I needed to stop because I was concerned that my love for music, which had really, when I was seven years old, saved my life. My parents split up, and I discovered 45s at that point. And I'm listening to all this incredible R&B music, and, and I'm just getting my life enriched by the sound and the grooves and the pockets and the songwriting and the singers like Aretha, you know, uh, yeah, all God these amazing yeah. vocalists uh, that just captivate Sam Cooke, you know, uh, Jackie Wilson, Marvin Gaye. These guys were killing it. And, and I just wanted to know, what are they doing? How do they do that? So it became a, an emotional obsession of mine to try to, to, to get a piece of that in me so I could experience it. So by the time I was successful, uh, so fortunate to be successful in the music business, uh, and at the end of that sort of like burnt spot I was just explaining, I had to just stop. I mean, Eddie, mm. I had no other solution. If I kept going, then... You know, you don't have to look too far to see people reaching outside to extra behaviors, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and, uh -huh. and we were all in the 80s, Eddie, okay? So uh, I didn't want to keep doing that, so I just stopped. You say there was even a period when you just stopped listening to music completely. That's correct. How long did that go on? Oh, boy, two years. I could not listen to music. The only thing I could listen to was this new thing that showed up on the horizon called ambient music. Uh, one of them called Liquid Mind was this <laughs> ambient artist yeah. and um, some other stuff like that. It was just, to me, the only thing I could really just soothe my PTSD, you know, because right. I was so worried that I was never going to write again, never going to find the passion for melody or, 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 you know, so I just stopped everything. I didn't sing. I didn't sing in the shower. I did nothing. I just walked. Steve Perry here on the Light Rock Morning Show. I'm imagining that this is still a very sensitive topic with you, but tell me about Kelly Nash and how she brought you out of some of those dark times. 
Well, Patty Jenkins is a really close friend of mine, and um, she's the director for The Last Wonder Woman. She actually originally directed the movie Monster with Charlize Theron, and now she's directing the new one, the new Wonder Woman. Um, through Patty, I had watched this special she was working on called Five on the Lifetime Network, and she's editing, and I saw this girl on the screen, and I said, well, who's that? She said it was a girl by the name of Kelly Nash. A PhD psychologist who actually had cancer. And I, I said, God, there's something about her. I don't know what it is. Would you send an email? She said, I will, but there's something I should tell you first before I send it. I said, what's that? She said she was in remission, but it came back in her bones and it's in her lungs and she's fighting for her life. I went, oh my God. You know, now what I do, my head said, run. My heart said, bull crap, you know, and my head said, don't do it. My heart said, send it. So I said, send it. And we had dinner June 16th and uh, we were inseparable after that. We were together for a year and a half. I mean, we did everything together. We just felt like we knew each other before we knew each other. And all the while she was dying. Well, but you'd never know it though. She was just so tenacious and so full of life and still doing all these terrible treatments and but just refusing mm. refusing to let it stop her from living it was it's an amazing I've thing isn't it when you run into someone like that i know a couple of people in my life who also have had cancer situations and the, and the strength that some people can conjure is just an amazing uh, yeah. thing isn't it yeah i i I don't know what to say, except that she's my hero. And um, one night we were talking and she turned to me and she said, honey, I need to ask you a favor. I said, what's that? Would you promise me something? And I went, uh oh, where's this going? You know? So I listened like I'm supposed to when someone says something like that. <laughs> and she says, if something was to ever happen to me, please uh, make me a promise that you won't go back into isolation for I think it would make this all for naught. And I just, I don't know, man. I, I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to think. I really didn't want to hear this, but I made a promise that I would not go back into isolation because, you know, Eddie, I mean, I wasn't like in a box. I was going to movies, living my life. You know, the fair comes to town every summer. <laughs> I was living my life. Sure. I just wasn't in the music business or writing music. Or in the spotlight. Or singing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, she had already heard some of my sketches that I was sort of messing with. And so that's what she said. So I think the new record uh, came about about a couple of years after she passed away. And I had grieved for at least two, three years. I uh, started writing and this record showed up. And my passion that I was afraid I'd never see again came back. And I, I just love music again. I, and I honestly, Eddie walked with a conviction that I don't need to have it. I already lived the dream of dreams. If it doesn't happen, that's okay. Because we did it so great, the band. We did it great. Um, but if it came back, great. If not, okay. But it came back. You even had a period where you questioned whether or not you had that great voice. You had that voice that moved so many people, and it really took getting into this project for you to realize it's still there. I, <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with my voice. I've always had a love-hate relationship with my voice, meaning that I'm really hard on myself, and I think other people hear it differently than I do, obviously, uh, because it's coming from me. But I can tell you that if you have fingers on a fret of a guitar or fingers on a bass guitar or fingers on a keyboard instrument or drumsticks in your hand, that's a different animal. When the instrument is you oh, yeah. and there's nothing else except this thing in your throat, it isn't just the thing in your throat. Did you get sleep? Did you drink enough water? Did you sing too hard the night before? What do you have tonight that you might have gave away the night before? It can be a maddening, neurotic game, okay? Um, so uh, I think I have 
too much of a close eye on all those nuances about my voice because mm. other people don't hear it. Yeah. You know, thank God I have a good co-producer, Tom Flowers, engineer, and we sat in my studio together, and I'd sing something. I'd go, well, I think I could do that better. He'd say, are you kidding? I love that. I'd say, but, but Tom, it could be a little bit more whatever. He'd go, no, nah, okay, well, go ahead, but we'll keep that too. And we go back to it because he was right, you know? So, like I said, I think it could be too close to it from my own standpoint. Steve Perry on the Light Rock Morning Show. We have so many Journey fans that listen to this radio station and have followed your whole career. I'm sure they would be interested to know of the songs you sang or the songs you wrote with the band. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a least favorite as far as Journey music goes? Well, <laughs> Whether it's Journey or Solo, I got to tell you, all the songs I've ever been a part of are like my children. I've always had a part in raising them, giving them something, pouring myself into them, whether it was something I wrote with a band or on my own. Uh, They're all special to me. Um, Obviously, a few of them have stood the test of time and have outlived our wildest expectations. Yeah, they've you know? been straight A students, um, those those children. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, they're all, to me, some of my favorites aren't the ones people even know about. Steve Perry, let's talk about the, the songs on the new album, beginning with No Erasing is the song that you're releasing first. What's the significance to you? What's it all about? Well, No Erasing is about uh, two people running into each other in a in a uh, class reunion situation and they haven't seen each other since they were in high school. Years have gone by and they leave the room and go outside and talk a little bit because they used to be, you know, they used to be close in high school. And uh, they go sit in her car and they go for a little drive and they park where they used to park and smooch. So they get in the back seat of a car and have a couple of smooches. No, no, no foul, no, no harm. <laughs> and just talk about old times and, and the passion that's still there, you know, that even though their lives have gone somewhere else, they still have some passion for what the time they had together. And in the spirit of that, that's kind of my relationship that I've rediscovered with the fans over the years. And they've, they've just... I don't know. Uh, they've just never left. I don't understand it, to be honest with you. I, I, I'm i grateful for it, but I'm just so amazed that they just seem to have They've They've stuck with you. There's there. no question. I see you have a brand new Facebook page to, to talk about this project, and there are just hundreds and hundreds of, of comments in the first day or two from people saying just that. We love you. We're so glad you're back, and we certainly feel that way, too. I mean, it's just it's so cool having you on here and, and talking to you. And, and I think you're going to do really well with this new project. So all the best. And I'm glad you're, you sound like you're in a good place. Thank you so much, Eddie. I really appreciate your time. I Thanks. so do. You're the best, Steve. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Talk to you soon.